to talk to you about a <coughs> project which started in February of last year. Not working. Yeah, that's mm. yeah. Why don't we go and get that? Yeah. We're talking about a project that started in February of last year uh, called Modern Fairies and Lonely Ladies. It's run out the music department in Sheffield, uh, co I uh, in medieval languages and literature uh, at Oxford. And it's predominantly a research project. We're about halfway through at the moment, so I'm just giving you a sense of some of the things that are coming out of it. Um, and we have a significant public facing element as well, so there will be four public performances at Sage Gateshead uh, in April of next year. Other than that, everything's kind of behind the scenes in terms of workshops that are taking place uh, in Sheffield and Oxford. So, the project has songwriters, poets, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about the artists, filmmakers, musicians, and so on. Uh, and its predominant focus is about taking intangible heritage from English folk tales. There are five thematic structures that Caroline has put together for that, uh, for the artists to work with. I'm not going to focus so much on the content specifically today, and uh, more around this particular research objective, which is whether this process that's going to happen throughout the life of the project with all of these different artists can take this material and re-mediate it as the terms are being used at the moment to make it relevant to modern audiences. Now part of that is in the context of Caroline, for example, has done quite a lot of work in writing on Game of Thrones. Um, she's based right opposite the pub that J.R.R. Tolkien used to get hammered in on a regular basis, with an understand it. Um, so it's situated within that kind of wider um, popular cultural context. Uh, these are the artists uh, on the project. I'd be interested to know actually whether you're familiar with any of them, because it's been very interesting for me kind of coming into it. Um, you might know Jackie Morris, who did the Lost Words book with Robert McFarlane, uh, Mary Wilson from Wars of Carthy, uh, Clown, uh, patients like Barbie, who apparently may be in line to be the next poet laureate, uh, from what I understand. Uh, Faye Hill, who is the uh, PI on the project. And what's interesting about the artist is that they actually work across both the subsidised and the commercial sectors, which is quite key to some of the themes that we're exploring in the project. Uh, so Ben Nichols, for example, was playing with Nadine Shaw at the Mercury Music Prize Awards recently. Uh, Jim Lockie uh, is in the band with his brother from uh, the band The Editors and so on. So a really interesting kind of mix of perceptions of their own sense of self-identity. Uh, which is quite important to some of the issues that we uh, will explore in the project. So, I'm going to look specifically at some of the kind of conceptual discursive issues that are still uh, very much live in the project uh, that we're looking at at the moment. I want to start by thinking around this idea that Hirschman calls the specificity of artistic production. Um, I'm just going to read you a little quote. So, Hirschman writes, the artist is normatively permitted to place higher priority on self and peer evaluations than upon commercial success. Now you might see some interesting resonances with academia there, I don't have time to explore those right now. Uh, but the idea that the artist in principle or practice or through some kind of normative functional structure uh, produces a product which consumers then either choose to accept or reject. Now, this might seem odd to start talking about marketing concepts, but it's actually the way that this idea of the autonomy and the agency of the artist from a marketing point of view is in, is in some form of contest, if you like, with this romantic view of artistic production. And what we found as we've worked through the artists in the project is that their sense of what they're doing on the project and their sense of as artists uh, is quite problematic. So these ideas that we have, and that's this language that we use around beauty, emotion, aesthetic, and ideals, um, is intentionally the idea of marketing where within the marketing concept, the consumer is sovereign. Okay? So 
Marketing functions as a form of taking artistic products to a market, but crucially, before it does that, it sees what the market wants and then seeks to satisfy a desire within it uh, to, to work towards uh, the market. What we have in the cultural sector, and this is why this marketing concept is important, for 72 years in England, we have had a state subsidised form of culture, first in the Arts Council of Great Britain and now the Arts Council of England, which runs counter to this process, okay? Uh, because in the art sector, we remain uh, producer-led. So we see this, uh, if you look at the major national institutions, which still, unfortunately, to the present day, are run by white, Oxford-educated uh, men. We have a producer-led, artistic director-led, uh, executive uh, producer, very Nick Heidner or Nick Sirota, uh, anybody who's run the RSC in the past 20 years. So, one of the ways that we're tackling this is by using Borgia's idea of cultural intermediaries. So, Borgia's idea, I'm sure you're probably familiar with this, came out through his research in France in the 1960s, when at the time these occupations, like working in advertising, marketing, PR, estate agents, were all very new ways of people having professions that intermediated with the supply of symbolic goods and services. And the idea of cultural intermediaries has gained increasing traction in the creative industries probably in the past 10 years as a way of starting to think about how the market has been unbuilt and rebuilt uh, in terms of the role of the artist. So an obvious example for the creative industries would be digital music. Digital music has disintermediated a lot of the functions of record companies and enabled artists to communicate directly with their audiences, either through their websites, blogs, and social media, and so on. So, what we're investigating at the moment is how the artists feel and how they situate and articulate their own experience of working on this project uh, in this kind of space between production and consumption. So, to give you an example of that, one of the things that is interestingly problematic for the artists is that they are essentially working to a brief on this project. It's an academic research project funded by the AHRC and they've been asked to produce and do specific things within a specific time frame. Um, they are very resistant to that idea. Some of them are very resistant to the idea of producing anything that counters the idea of working towards the market. They see it as antithetical to their own sense of self as an artist. So we started to discover some work through the data that even though they are all very active across social media channels and they're all very conscious of how their industry works, they still retain a really romantic attachment to the romantic idea um, of being an artist. And just to unpack that slide, just to give you a uh, more specific example of that. Um, the romantic idea of the artist in a painting of Oprah or Brush, supplanted what was traditionally a sense of the... Uh, the second example of Michelangelo, the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo would never have considered himself to be an artist. He never described himself as an artist. Nobody at the time called him an artist, because there was no such thing as the artist as we understand it now, as being somebody who has a muse, somebody who's in touch with the gods, somebody who's operating in this kind of pseudo-religious transcendental, sublime way. He was a craftsman who had a specific set of skills. And in that context and in his time, he was not differentiated in any way from any other craftsperson. He might build a table. Uh, he might build a bridge. And if we transpose contemporary cultural policy ideas backwards, we can see then that Michelangelo, as a craftsperson, his art, as it is, be used in entirely utilitarian ways. Uh, so, it can be instrumentalised in terms of building a uh, uh, painting the Sistine Chapel. One of the problems that we have in cultural policy today, specifically in the subsidised cultural sector, is a strong resistance to the idea of anything being instrumentalised. Because we see culture being increasingly instrumentalised in the same way that we see the academy being increasingly instrumentalised in ways to deliver specific market outputs. So that's the kind of broad conceptual context um, of what we're looking at. In terms of some of the things that have come out to that, the artists <coughs> themselves are, are struggling, I think is probably the right word, 
in terms of thinking about their own agency and autonomy within this process. What's really interesting is that they have all gone on a journey of questioning their own sense of self-identity as artists and their relationship with the market as we work through the project. Um, we've been sort of exploring ideas, particularly some uh, from Philip Ross, um, and what's become obvious is that their sense of their relationship to the market and therefore their own sense of agency and autonomy in terms of whether they should engage with the market is around which career stage they're at. So as the comment came out, that's fine if you're Philip Roth and you're a multimillionaire living in your big apartment in New York, you can choose to disregard the market at that stage, that's fine. What if you're right at the start of your career like I am and I need to think about the market? How do I engage, uh, engage with those ideas? So this self-conceptualization of them as either performers or researchers has become really problematic for them. Um, they don't in any way happily or readily self-identify as researchers. They don't see themselves as being part of the research process. Uh, and so that has led us to one of the bigger issues within the project, which is that from a methodological point of view in terms of the research team, we have slipped and slided between this kind of practice-led and practice-based um, approach. So in a very simple sense, practice-led approach is doing research in order to inform our understanding of practice. And obviously we have 12 artists working on this in a number of different art forms, trying to produce cross-art form types of work. Um, and we keep telling them that despite the fact that there are public performances at the stage, uh, Gate said in April of next year, the end point of the process is not product, it's not cultural artifact, which would lead us to be a practice-based approach. It's phenomenally difficult to get creative artists to produce work, but tell them that they don't need to have work produced at the end of the process, uh, which uh, it would be good that we haven't resolved this at all. It's going to be one of the next kind of set of questions that we have with them, um, because their default setting is to produce work. Um, and I mentioned earlier about this idea of creative reciprocity because they are not used to working in a collaborative format in order to produce work that seeks to engage the public in the process of producing work because they're attached to this romantic idea of being artists. So we have all of these kinds of very complex, difficult ideas that are in this kind of cooking pot at the moment. Um, and I'm going to say to spend three days with them all uh, in the middle of January, and that's going to be the next stage of the research process, is to try and unpack uh, how they think about all of these things. And finally, which we haven't got to yet, um, what we'll get to, is that part of this process of remediation, part of this attempt, to take their romantic ideas of themselves as artists to it in order to amuse the market and put them in a context where they are given audience feedback in this constant iterative loop throughout the process uh, through engagement on social media. So we did a Facebook Live concert and had 250 people who were watching it and engaging with the artists uh, at the time. We've done a kind of semi-private rehearsal performances, we invited audiences and so on. And the idea without, deliberately without using the term co-creation, the idea is to start bringing the audience in and folding them into this process to see how it challenges uh, these kind of preconceived ideas uh, of themselves as artists. So do please go onto the website, I haven't got time to play a video now. Uh, there's a really beautiful video, this is Barney Walsh Brown, Mary Watson uh, and Van Nichols. Um, they've all worked together on this song called Green Children. Uh, which is very beautiful as a video of it. This is in the rehearsal space at Sheffield. Um, I think that's me. <laughs>